We'll be looking at Jesus Christ, who is the mediator this morning. And specifically, we'll be looking at how Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. And it's really important for us to understand how these three offices were in the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfills it, all three of those. And it's really important to see that connection. So today's message, in a sentence, is this. There were three kinds of mediators in the Old Testament. Prophet, priest, and king. And in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he is all three. And I'll repeat that once more because I don't have an overhead on that. There were three kinds of mediators in the Old Testament. Prophet, priest, and king. And in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he is all three. And that's really important for us to see that connection. You know, lots of times we, we use the scriptures and apologetics, for instance, we'll use the scripture talking about how Jesus is the only mediator between God and man of 1 Timothy. It says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, or humanity, as it says in the ESV or in the uh, Christian Standard Version, the man, Jesus Christ. And I think when we read this quote, lots of times we might run into a problem and think that talking about Jesus as mediator, we only think of it as his sacrificial death on the cross, dying for our sins, and a mediator between God and man. Or we may use it, only say it and think of it as when we're praying to God, he is the only mediator between God and man. And that is true. Those are truths. Jesus is that. And matter of fact, that's why we don't pray to saints. We don't pray to a person. We don't need any other mediator because Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man. Praise God. But it's much bigger than that when we look at the scripture than those two things about a sacrifice on the cross and about prayer. And although that like I said, it is true in making the scripture limit in scope if we don't see Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. Jesus being our mediator is very big, and we need to understand that. So our scripture this morning is from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And in those three scriptures, we see prophet, priest, and king. The only difference is it's a slight different order. It goes prophet, king, and priest. So this morning, that is where we are. Before I read the scripture, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do love you, we do praise you, and we thank you for another opportunity to come before your throne of grace, knowing that you are the only be mediator between God and man. We thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for our sins. But Lord, we also thank you that your prophet, your priest, your king of kings, and Lord of lords, and so as we approach your word this morning, Lord, in a study on the truth of your word as prophet, priest, and king, help us to see the connection between the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Testament or New Covenant. Help us to see you in the old and see you how you presented the truth in the new. So help us, Lord, as we study this morning to see the things you want us to see. Help us to grasp on and to remember those things that will help us in our daily walk with you. We love you, Lord, and we praise you for what you do for us. Guide us and direct us as we study together from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And by the way, if there was something that I said, and sometimes I get talking quick, I get, if I'm from Jersey, sometimes I'll get that Jersey talk coming in. If I do that, I do make a copy or a mans manuscript of everything I preach because I, I study beforehand, so you can always ask me and I could give you a copy. So that's, that's not an issue. So as we see in the scripture, long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. And then in verse 2, we see, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe, the universe through him. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I chose these three scriptures in Hebrews this morning because we see all three offices. 
We see Christ Jesus embedded in them. In verse 2, we see Jesus as prophet. In verse 3, we see priest, and we also see king. These are three titles for Jesus that are clearly taught in the Bible and church to the glory of God. This is where we are in our family groups. Matter of fact, if you notice, in September, we had prophet. In October now, we are talking about priest. And then next, the next month, we'll be talking about our king, king of kings and lord of lords. And so you see this as we're going. And again, we're, we're only doing a, a slight synopsis of what this is. And praise God, we have these family groups. And we could come and get into a deeper study. And I'm hoping that if you're not connected at this point in a family group, that you will think about getting involved with a family group. Because these are the things that we talk about. Think about it. Four weeks at least on prophet. Four weeks at least on priest and four weeks at least on King. And this will help us to really have an understanding. So in a short time right this morning, we will just cover a short bit or a little part of it. So long ago, God spoke to the fathers by prophets at different times and different ways. The first thing we must take notice of in this text, it starts with God Almighty. We, we start with God. And the Hebrew starts with God. Of course, this makes sense because without God, nothing would exist. And we also see nothing would exist without Jesus in the scripture also. And we would not be able to understand anything about God. To you know God comes from God, revealing himself. And this has always been the way since God had created time and when he created man until a present. He wants us to know him. He wants us to know him intimately. He wants us to know him in many ways. And he presents and mediates and comes and teaches us and reveals himself to us throughout the ages and especially in his son. Let's look at Hebrews now and really clearly see how our text this morning is dealing with the way God has revealed himself through human agency. Look again at verse 1 in Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. Here we clearly see that God has spoke to us throughout the ages by his prophets. And that brings us to a question which we must ask is, what is a prophet? What is a prophet? A prophet is one of God's called and given a special mis message to give to his people. Prophets are messengers who foretold and foretold God's word. To foretell is to tell what's going to happen. And we see that in a lot of the Old Testament scriptures. We see the prophecies about how Christ would come, how he would be virgin born, how he would die in Isaiah 53. And we see many, many other things about our Lord embedded throughout the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. And by the way, talking about Hebrews, Hebrews is the best of our New Testament books. It's the best commentary on the Old Testament. Because it goes into details and explains why things happen in the Old Testament and why they are as they are and we recognize it in the New Testament. So there's sort of a swinging door going back between the Old Testament to the New Testament so that we can understand God's word as revealed in the Old but understand what it means in the New Testament. And so that's why it's so important for us to understand that. So foretelling for, for is to tell what's going to happen to the receiver of the message. We have the Old Testament prophets telling us about the coming of Messiah Jesus. There he would be born, how he would be born, how he would die for our sins, and many other details. A prophet can also be one who foretells. And foretells what God's will is for the people. Take, for instance, how God tell, tells the people of the judgment that would come to all the, those who reject him. And so we are clear in Scripture that there is both prophet who is a foreteller or a foreteller. So we see prophet is one receiving a message from God to the people as we read in the Bible in the Old Testament. These men revealed the mind of God to the people. They said things like, thus says the Lord. Because these were the words of God being presented to mankind to understand it's God's voice. And a very important thing for us to know, too, about a prophet, when a prophet spoke, it was facing the people. He was a voice piece for God saying, thus 
says the Lord. Thus says the Lord God Almighty. And even when it went against God's people and what they were doing, and sometimes they, they would even die as a prophet because they were speaking the truth. A prophet had a heavy job, but he knew he was a voiceman speaking God's word, God's truth. And mankind, that went, sometimes it went against them, and sometimes it went with what they were saying. But the problem is that people lots of times wanted to be their own boss. Don't we at, our, at times ourselves want to be our own boss? And even though God shows us stuff in the scripture, and we know clearly what God says in certain things, we don't do it. Many times we'll, we'll go against it. But praise God for the Holy Spirit who convicts us and says, what are you doing? Get back on course. And praise God that he speaks through his word and by his Holy Spirit to our hearts, the hearts of mankind. So hopefully we can see the point of the writer of Hebrews to us. God spoke through his prophets in different times and in different ways. This included dreams, God's voice from heaven, signs and wonders through many different personalities of men from Abraham, who was obedient from the start, to Jonah, who ran in the opposite direction from his start. God used many, many different ones to communicate to the people of old. And even today, God speaks to us through these same prophets, which is glorious for us to know. Today, as you read your Bibles and you read the Old Testament, you're hearing the voice of God through the pages of Holy Scripture. In these last days, we come to verse 2. In these last days, He, that's God, has spoken to us by His Son, Jesus. God has appointed Him heir of all things and made the universe through him. Here we get some new revelation. We are in the last days. First of all, we see in these scriptures in the last days. From the moment our Lord Jesus came on the scene, from that moment, the Old Testament, the covenant people were waiting for the day the Messiah would come. The anointed would, would come in the last days. Jesus' prophet has spoken to us through these last days. Jesus' prophet has shown us much and revealed in the New Testament. Jesus had spoken to us and said at different times different things. And one of the things we see in Acts chapter 3, verses 17 through 23, we see how we have our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and how they knew who he was. And now brothers, in Acts chapter 3, 17, and now brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your leaders also did. In this way, God fulfilled what he had predicted through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that a season of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, who had appointed for you as Messiah. Heaven must receive him until the time of restoration of all things, which God spoke about through his holy prophets from the beginning. 23 or 22 says, Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers and sisters. And it says, you must listen to everything he tells you. And everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from the people. And so we get some stern warnings also in the New Testament about how we are to listen to Jesus Christ. And as we read in Acts, the Messiah, our Lord Jesus, foretold about the, to speak to us that we are told to listen to him in his last days. He has spoken to us, son. One of the things that Jesus said, and I think we're very familiar with this scripture from John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but through me. This is Jesus speaking prophetically about who he is. When he spoke, he actually spoke the words of God at every moment. This is a clear warning from our Lord so that he is the only way to the Father. So anyone who tries to get to God void of the Son 
the Bible says, is not going to see the Father. See, you can't love the Father and not love the Son. And you cannot love the Son and not love the Father. You can't get around it. The scripture is clear. And one of the many things Jesus spoke and, and, and said to us is that we, without any ideas of the world, can't go through any other way. And here's a side note about that. Many people say there are just different names for God. How many of you have heard that? Oh, you know, Allah is just another name for God, or this is another name for God, or, you know, all gods are the same God, just different voices or different ways of presenting God or, or saying God. We're all okay, so long as we just believe in God. Have you heard that? But how can you say that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me? It doesn't work. It's, it's, it's just impossible. You know, religions and cults, the, the cults, they deny Christ for who he really is. And I, it can't be both ways. Either Jesus came from heaven and earth to save us from sin, death, and hell, or God is a liar. I mean, that's the only two, two choices in what we read in, our, in the Holy Scriptures. We know, God is a not, in the, we know that God is not a liar. He is the sovereign God of over all creation, loved us enough to send his only son, Jesus, to come to pay the price for our sins. The Holy Spirit confirms this in our hearts as born-again believers. The Bible also tells us in 1 John chapter 5, 13, he says, I have written these things in order that you may know, know, listen, know that you have, have, it's talking about presently, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can know without a shadow of a doubt in Christ Jesus through his holy word as he prophesied and told us and, and taught us and, and gave other men, apostles, to share with us the truth of who Jesus is. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Let us look at what else we can learn from Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3. We now see King Jesus. Now the order in Hebrews goes to king next and then priest. But it's really important for us to catch this order. And I think it's important as we go through the scripture this morning. In these last days, verse 2 of Hebrews 1. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God had appointed him heir of all things. And made the universe through him, Jesus. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now, in the Old Testament, with a king came a kingdom. Is that not right? Otherwise, the king would look ridiculous. Say, I'm in a hat there. He has no people, right? A king had a kingdom. And a kingdom was either with God or was against God. There were good prophets and bad prophets. There were good kings, there were bad kings. And we see that in the scriptures. So in the Old Testament, we see the king again as a mediator, a mediator for the people by keeping them in line, by helping the people listen to God and his law and to keep them unified as a people of God. See, that was a king's job. He would receive his office from God and sometimes go in God's direction and sometimes against God's directions, but they were accountable before God, not only for themselves, but for the people. And so a good king would do the things that were right in God's eyes. They, were led, they would lead God's people, God's way, and they would be just in the things that we do. And we see kings in the Bible, how sometimes they would make decisions and that they would make decisions that would affect all of the people. And we would see sometimes even as a law court. And so they were the king to represent God's people also before the world around them. So the Old Testament, a king had a big job. We, we already have seen how Jesus is prophet 
in speaking and revealing to us the way into eternal life and to heaven with him. He faced the people with the reality of believing or rejecting him and both have consequences. The king had a kingdom that was supposed to glorify God. See, God's kings, their job was to glorify God by doing the things that bring glory to God, representing the help and the people to act and to live the way they were supposed to under his authority or lordship. Now we see the full control of our Lord and Savior over all things as king. And let us look at this. First of all, in our scriptures this morning, as we look in Hebrews, breaking it down as an outline form, we see he's an heir of all things. Jesus is an heir of all things. All things are his. And then he's the creator of the world and all that is in it. You know, just a little while ago, Scott was sharing with us out of Colossians, a, a, a great scripture. And um, I'd like us to look at that Colossians scripture again in chapter 1, starting with verse 12 through 20. And it reads like this. Giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in light. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his son he loves. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you highlight in your Bible, there's some books in the Bible where it's really helpful to highlight personal pronouns. Like if you go into the book of Ephesians, and every time you see him, he, his, you, you will see that it's like everywhere. It's all talking about our Lord, okay? And in this section of Scripture, the same thing happens in Colossians, verses 15 through 20 here. If you were to take a highlighter, and every time you see he and him, or himself, and highlight that, you would see that this is all talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's a powerful thing to do if you have never done it, to, to practice doing that once in a while. If you don't write the Bible, I'm not telling you to go write the Bible. If you're convicted about that, don't do it. But if you highlight your Bibles, and I do, I almost too much sometimes, um, if you, you highlight, have a way of just capturing the personal pronouns and what we're about to read. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, he... Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him, Jesus, in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And then there's more. He is before all things. And by him, all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was to please to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace, through his blood shed on the cross. And it continues to say we were once alienated and hostile in mind, but by the blood of Christ, we are changed. And so, he's the creator of the world and all that is in it. And he is completely God, not lacking anything as we just read. He upholds all things. Basically, he has control of the whole world in his hands. This is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of the Father right now. And one day will be returning for his people. Praise the Lord. This is a clear picture showing us that Jesus is King Jesus. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, 
who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And catch verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Verse 11, capture this. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, to call Jesus Lord is to say he is your big boss. He's the one who's in control and the only one who you trust totally. See, one day everyone will bow before, the, before King Jesus, everybody. And that's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And one day everybody will say, that is truth. But for some it will be too late. And they'll admit it. But they won't be one of his. And I... That shakes me at the core thinking that there could be even people in their, their sanctuary this morning here or, or listening or in our overflow room and thinking about that you may have denied Jesus as Lord and Savior, which is clearly shown to us in the Holy Scripture. And I pray that the Holy Spirit takes your heart and shakes it up and wakes you up to the truth and gives you eyes and, and able to all of a sudden to see the truth of God's word with fresh insight and understanding that only he can do through his Holy Spirit. And I pray that for you. See, one day everybody, like I said, will bow to King Jesus. Reading about the end times, we see in Revelation 17, verse 14, it says, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords, King of kings, and those with him are called the chosen and the faithful. Are you the chosen and are you the faithful? In Hebrews 1, 6, in the chapter which we're looking at this morning, it says, God the Father says about the Son, let all the angels worship him. Let all the angels worship him. Who would angels worship? A God. And God's telling the angels to worship Jesus, who is God in the flesh. Not that it's an easy subject, but it's clear. It's clear as can be in Scripture everywhere. Jesus is King Jesus, worthy of full worship. And as we already seen, Jesus is prophet and king. But it does not end there. We also see Jesus as priest. In verse 3, the second part of verse 3, it says, After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now think about this. Taking again the Old Testament. During the Old Testament, or Old Covenant, the priests would intercede for the people as mediator between man and God, seeking mercy and seeking grace for the people. Unlike prophets who faced the people, where the prophets faced the people, unlike that, the priests faced God Almighty. The priests would face God Almighty as a spokesman for the people. The priest, after cleansing himself on Yom Kippur, the Day of, of Atonement, he would face God with offerings for the people of God for their sins and also pray on their behalf. Before God Almighty, it was an annual offering year after year. The priest had a duty to intercede for God's people, and all who believe and trust in Jesus are God's people. As priests, he made intercession for the sins by being the sacrifice to atone for our sins. That is who our Lord and Savior becomes. His life purifies us from our sins totally. And notice in the, in the scripture in chapter 3 of Hebrews chapter 1, after making purification for sins, okay, in the New Testament, the Old Testament, we know that they had to do it annually, year after year after year, because it was never a finished, completed work. 
But in Christ, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. We get a clear picture of the Lord had made purification of sins, and he, this brings us to the point that we need to bring home here. He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Why did he ascend to heaven? Because the work that he came to do for the forgiveness of our sins was complete. It was finished. To tell us die, it was stamped complete. Our Lord when he died on the cross, he paid it all. Our purification is by him and him alone. Fellow, fellow sinners, see, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. Are we not? And, and if you're saying you're not a sinner, you just lied and so you just sinned anyway. So you just proved you're a sinner, correct? We're all sinners before holy God. Every single one of us are sinners before holy God. This morning I ask you, is your faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone? You cannot work your way into heaven. And that's why Jesus came as the perfect sacrifice, paying the full price completely so we are set free from sin, death, and hell. We get that clear picture in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. And I want to close with this scripture as we get ready to wrap this up. In Hebrews chapter 9, 24 through 28, it reads this. And listen to this. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, like the temples. You know, they were, they were copies of the true things, right? But into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf as the only mediator between God and man. Only one. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest entered the holy places every year with blood not his own. Verse 26. For then he, Jesus, would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, catch this, this is so important. 26, but as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It's a done deal. It's a done deal in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He paid the price. We are set free from our sin. And we all admit it, we're sinners. God paid that price and set us free from our sin. How glorious is that? What a God that we worship. What a God that we serve. And so, and so verse 26 again, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world, but as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And... Just as it's a point for men to die once, there's no reincarnation, there's no second chance. You die once. You die once, and then you face God. There's no second chances after you're dead. The Bible says right here in verse 27, and Jesus, as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And last verse, verse 28. So, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, he will appear a second time. What a day that will be, amen? But, catch this, not to deal with sin. Why not to deal with sin? Because it's already been dealt with. It's a finish on the cross. And his resurrection justifies that truth that we know without a shadow of doubt who he is. Not to deal with sin but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. Are you waiting for him? You know, there's a day when we all have to stand before him. And hopefully we've all been able to clearly see who our Lord Jesus is. Our Lord is prophet, priest, 
and king. Amen? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do love you and praise you and thank you for this church and the proclamation of your word that you will speak to your people and share through your holy scriptures. Your word is truth. And so, Lord, we take these words today as we studied from, about how you are prophet, priest, and king. Help us, Lord, to understand the truth of that. Help us to live our lives to the glory of, of you and to share with others their need for you as Savior and Lord also. We love you, Lord, and we praise you as King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.